We've talked often on this podcast about the leadership change that's been taking place at all levels of the Cleveland power structure. Yesterday, we learned about a leadership change that very few people will be excited to hear about. It's kind of a sad day for Cleveland, and it'll be the first story we talk about on Today in Ohio, the news podcast discussion from Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. I'm Chris Quinn. I'm here with Laura Johnston, Layla Tassi, and Lisa Garvin. And I think this first story is going to get us all talking. Eric Gordon has led the Cleveland schools th through turmoil and transformation, seeing the district take steps year after year to become better. Layla, why is he leaving at the end of this school year? Well, Gordon will be making himself available to the media today, so hopefully we'll find out more about his motivation. But yesterday he said in a news release that the timing seemed right for, for a transition to a new school leader. He's been with the district for 11 years, which is longer than a lot of superintendents stick around. He's, he's presided over major transformational initiatives and ha has seen the district through some really rocky times, including those long stretches of remote learning through the pandemic. Lots of sources yesterday were expressing their sadness about his departure from the school board chair to the union president who said that Gordon treated teachers as partners in education rather than obstacles. And Mayor Justin Bibb said he was really shocked when Gordon came to him and announced that he planned to leave. He said that Gordon told him he wanted to spend more time with his family. Bibb was really full of praise for Gordon and he he really vehemently denied any rumors that the two of them were at odds over their philosophies on education. He called that completely false. Um, both of them seem well, to, yeah. Well, one just rumors. There were people talking about it on Twitter with no sourcing. And, and look, if they're lying about that, that'll come out. So I'm, I'm taking them at face value that there was no conflict between them and that that was just spurious. If, if they're lying, they'll be held to pay later. But let's just take it at face value for now. Yeah. So, you know, um, Gordon, among his greatest achievements was that he was one of the architects of the Cleveland plan, and he, he pushed to get House Bill 525 signed into law in 2012 that enabled those reforms. And, and the goal of the Cleveland plan was to increase the number of high-performing schools by providing school support while letting administrators uh, retain decision-making autonomy. They created the Cleveland Transformation Alliance and they invested in the best programs and the best teachers. And the result was a dramatically boosted graduation rate in the district. And then, there, of course, there was Say Yes to Education. Gordon signed the district onto that scholarship program in 2018, and it gives full scholarships to graduates for all public colleges, universities, and Pell-eligible job training programs in the state, plus some private schools. So student enrollment in post-secondary education has climbed from 44% to 49%, and it's uh, so it's been you know reasonably uh, successful so far in its early years. So, but, 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 but let's talk a bit about, I mean, anybody that's dealt with him knows he's yeah. a true educator, right? He's a giant among education thinkers. And he followed two extremely mediocre CEOs. Cleveland went to mayoral control of the schools, whatever it was, 23, 25 years ago. The first one is now serving a prison term because she's a crook for what she did after she left. Eugene Sanders was much more of a dilettante than an educator. And Frank Jackson picked Eric Gordon almost because he, he didn't have much choice. The, the, it, it, people don't, might not remember, but Eric was interim for a long, long time. And that's how an educator became CEO. He turned out to be great. Anybody that's dealt with him knows the passion he has for the children. I mean, he mentors all sorts of individual children himself. He's been a tireless advocate for, for children. Every conversation we've had, Layla, and you and I have had many with him separately, you walk away happy. Our, our Two of our reporters did a, a long interview with him for a project we're starting on Monday. And you said last week how jealous you were that you <laughs> wish you could have been there for that interview. I know, because I really love talking to him. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with him that I didn't walk away from it feeling completely inspired. You know, sometimes... Um, you know, I've been I've had conversations where he was, you know, moved to tears by the things that we were discussing. And and, you know, he 
clearly he feels he was called to this work and specifically that his work, he was called to his work in Cleveland. And to, you know, Hannah and Cameron, who were about to launch this very special education project around CMSD, spent time talking to Gordon recently. And this is what he said about that calling. He said, I think people who come to urban education come here because they're driven to make a difference. I mentioned work, you know, he worked in at an affluent suburb, suburban school, Olentangy, uh, local schools outside of Columbus for a period of time. And he said, great kids, great families, but they're going to be fine. Whether I was there or not, they were going to be fine. I used to tease that I could put them in the closet in cryogenic freeze in the fall and thaw them out in the spring, and they were still going to pass the state test. (laughs) They were going to be fine. I am here today, and I will tell you 6,700 educators in all of our roles are here today, because if not us, who? Right. That that that's the essence of Eric Gordon. And every time we've dealt with him, every time he's come over to talk to us, you just walk away impressed. And the fact that that Frank Jackson stood behind him all those years is a big deal. When he closed the schools, he caught hell. There were a lot of supporters of the schools that thought that was a huge mistake. But Eric Gordon knows his students, and he knows a lot of them have single parents at home who had a lot of comorbidities. And if these kids brought home the virus before anybody had any protection, they can end up as homeless kids. And so he wasn't going to do that. He put their health and welfare first. When the report cards come out Thursday, the state report cards, I'm sure that Cleveland will have taken a big tumble because of that homeschooling. But Eric Gordon knows the district best. I I just, this is heartbreaking. And this project we're launching on Monday, it's going to be going on for a long time. We embedded two students in a classroom since last November, two uh, reporters, and we will have weekly, twice weekly content laying out the challenges that that Eric Gordon's team faces and how they meet it. It's Mm -hmm. great stuff. I I guess it'll be his legacy because he'll be gone at the end of this school year. I know. It's (laughs) so, so sad about this. But yes, yeah, he gave he gave Hannah Drown and Cameron Fields this unprecedented access to a fourth grade classroom. And now they are fifth graders um, to to observe in in, you know, a setting unlike anything we've ever had access to before. Uh, what yeah, I don't it is. think anybody yeah. has had that kind of access. I mean, who else would take two reporters and basically for two entire school years have them embedded in the classroom, going home with the kids, seeing the so kids special. with their social work. I mean, this is going to be magical stuff. And it's a credit to Eric that he gave us access. Lisa, you came to town. You're, you're a native of Cleveland, but you came back to town after being away for decades. You've seen other educators. What, what's the kind of outsider's view on Eric Gordon? That he cares, that he has a heart as big as Ohio. I mean, I don't think I've met, since I joined the editorial board in 2018, I don't know that I've met a public official that's so dedicated to his job and so cares about it. It's not something that he takes off at the end of the day. And I find it interesting that you said that he actually counsels individual children because That seems like the kind of guy that he is. And I don't know that we'll find someone like him again. That's what frightens me. We won't. I mean, what what we'll get is another administrator. I mean, this we got an educator almost by accident and by default. And unless we find somebody that is as devoted as him, I I think we're in trouble. I mean, this is not that the schools have made progress in the face of insurmountable challenges because of his leadership, because he cares so deeply. And it's going to be a very difficult challenge for the school board and, and Mayor Bibb to find his replacement. It's a tough one to see him go out the door. And I, you know, we've had some people critical of him in recent years, like I said, because of closing the schools. Our columnist, Justice Hill, wrote a column, I think, Layla, not long ago, where he basically was criticizing where the schools stand under him. And there is that sentiment. But I, I've never met in my career anybody in education that in, in his role that kind of works like he does. It's a tough day for Cleveland. You're listening to Today in Ohio. After two and a half years of visitation restrictions because of the pandemic, the Cleveland Clinic made a dramatic announcement Monday that will be welcome to anyone with a relative in the hospital. Laura, is this the end of the pandemic? 
Maybe. I mean, you, <laughs> how many times can we say we're nearing the end before we talk about it? There's another, you know, steep rise. But this is a huge turning point. All visitors are allowed in the Cleveland Clinic. There will be no more COVID-19 screenings, no more set visiting hours or limits on the number of visitors a patient can have. And this applies to both inpatient and outpatient. Obviously, the ICU has different standards. They may have specific visitation rules, and you still need to wear a mask inside all facilities. But remember the very beginning of COVID when these people were incredibly sick and dying, and they weren't even allowed to have their family members inside the hospital with them? I mean, we have really climbed out of that horrendous kind of trench. Well, and and I was being facetious. Obviously, the pandemic's not over. People are dying every day. There's a new round of vaccines out to try and stop the spike that'll come in October. But what has happened is we've learned to live with it. The pandemic has become endemic and society is going back to the basic rules that existed before. The the hospital visitation rules were crippling for mm-hmm. anybody that had a sick relative or or terminally ill relative. So this is a big step forward for people to have some closure and some comfort with their ill relatives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And people who have tested positive for COVID or been exposed to someone who've tested positive, they need to wait 10 days before they go visit the hospital. So I hope people are using common sense. And then if you're visiting someone who has COVID-19, you have to follow some guidelines, which include the mask everyone's got to wear, plus eye protection, a gown, and gloves. But yeah, people who are ill, people who have surgeries, kids in the hospital, you know, visiting your family members, this is, is such good news for people who are are stuck there and want to see their friends and family. Okay, you're listening to Today in Ohio. Abortion rights supporters won a victory Monday by having their challenge to a restrictive state abortion law dismissed. How does that work as a victory exactly, Lisa? Well, the Ohio Supreme Court was kind of dragging their feet on this, and they were kind of standing in the way. So the Ohio Supreme Court did grant dismissal of a lawsuit at the request of Ohio abortion providers who filed that lawsuit challenging the fetal heartbeat law. What this does, though, is it paves the way for Hamilton County Common Police Court Judge uh, Christian Jenkins to rule on a temporary restraining order. To that would that order would provide time for them to argue the constitutional issue issues and, uh, you know, keep the the fetal heartbeat law from going into effect in, until they resolve all these constitutional issues. The uh, the attorney from the general attorney general's office is against the temporary restraining order, but there hasn't been a ruling yet. And the problem was is that abortion providers, you know, basically asked the Ohio Supreme Court to, uh, you know, rule on the constitutionality of abortion, and they weren't getting a ruling. And it, this was harming women all across Ohio. They said, you know, conditions were dire back then when the, the fetal heartbeat law went into, into effect. And things have just gotten worse in the couple of months since then. So, yes, it sounds, you know, it doesn't sound, you know, right. But, yeah, this lawsuit was standing in their way. I get that this is the short term solution, that right now we have a problem in Ohio with the heartbeat bill. Women do not have the availability of an abortion as they did before the Dobbs ruling. And I've said but I've said this before, the long term solution to this is the constitutional amendment as they're seeking in Michigan. And it's distressing. We're seeing no movement on that. There, there just is no effort being made to get that done. Whereas in Michigan, right across our border, they're going to vote on this in November. And so Michigan could be guaranteed in their constitution a right to abortion while Ohio is still messing around trying to figure out what to do. What is it about Ohio and not moving forward with the permanent solution? And, and I'm a little bit worried about what the attorney general's office seems to be signaling. This, this case on the temporary restraining order in Hamilton County, like I said, the uh, an attorney from the attorney general's office, they're against it. They say that the, the fetal heartbeat law does not conflict with the Ohio Constitution of Individual Liberties. And they're saying also further that women are not in peril in Ohio. So that's a little bit discouraging. The interesting thing, though, is across the country, there are Republicans realizing that they went too far with this. There are some state legislatures that are Republican controlled that were unable to come up with an abortion ban because they are hearing from voters. I'm hearing, seeing the undercurrent. There are a whole lot of women 
that are quietly getting ready to vote in large numbers. You keep hearing about these pockets of people talking about, yeah, I'm done. Men aren't going to hold dominion over my body. We're going to change this. And Republicans are starting to realize that it's a fascinating moment. Uh, I just wonder why Ohio is not working to enshrine it in the Constitution is <laughs> bizarre. Yeah, or why any of the political candidates are, are not calling for it either. Like Nan Whaley, I'm looking at her. Yeah, Nan, I just don't know what's going on with Nan Whaley's campaign. It's virtually non-existent. You're listening to Today in Ohio. Did Cuyahoga County get some recognition? And by recognition, we mean cash for its work to reduce the jail population by treating the mental health and addiction issues of arrestees. Layla? Yeah, Cuyahoga County accepted two grants from the U.S. Department of Justice worth about $500,000 apiece. And one will be used to support the Diversion Center, which seeks to provide mental health and addiction treatments to suspects who would otherwise end up in jail. And the other grant is for the county central booking model, which they're still trying to get off its feet. And that seeks to streamline and, and improve the jail booking process and all the other related court processes. These grants are intended to improve the functioning of the criminal justice system and prevent or combat juvenile delinquency and assist victims of crime. So these two Cuyahoga County initiatives really fit the bill there. It's unclear how the county plans on using the grant money on the Diversion Center and its programs, but the courts, the records submitted at the Board of Control yesterday do show that the central booking facility grant will be used to buy technology and equipment, including about 60 laptops, 30 workstations, and some other office furnishings. So yeah, they're getting some cash for for their uh, big big doings. Well, it, well, what's sad is they did the right thing. They set up the diversion center. It's mm-hmm. supposed to reduce the jail population. It's supposed to help people. And from what we understand, it's virtually empty because <laughs> police have not figured out they should take people there. And the jail staff has not started to unilaterally send people over for services. And it and it's part of this stagnancy we have with the jail reform and bail reform. I know. The, the there judges is a sense are of stagnancy. Not, You're right. Yeah. I mean, it's... It, it, somebody needs to lead it and maybe it'll be the next county executive, but we've reached a point where it could be a dramatic step. Fill that diversion center up, help people overcome their issues, reduce the jail population, reduce the dangers over there. I mean, everything's in place and nothing's happening, but they got some money to try and move it along. So hopefully they will. Well, and also the central booking facility, you know, when Caitlin Durbin checked in with them in July, they had, you know, basically they had a soft opening for the facility, but and inmates had been passing through there, but they were being booked using the traditional booking process rather than the expedited one. And they told Caitlin that they expected to be running shortly after Labor Day. So we'll be checking back in soon to find out how that's going. But you know, it's <laughs> right, but, time but, to get but, the train but, out of the station here. <laughs> you know, let's go. Right. They're, they're, they have all this where they can make a difference. But what are they doing? They're racing to buy a toxic site <laughs> to build a new jail. That's what they're racing. Pernell Jones is counting votes. They've scheduled the meetings. They plan to buy the site by what? The second week of October. That's their, their rush. Man, so many people are questioning that now. They're starting to wonder what's going on in the back room because this doesn't make sense and people are raising questions about do we need to have somebody really investigate what they're talking about Mm -hmm. back there well county council returns today from their recess and that is on their agenda to discuss i know but people are starting to talk about them like they need to be investigated because nothing they're doing makes sense and when nothing makes sense you have to look at the the bad reasons they might be doing it they shouldn't buy the the polluted land nobody wants them to do that and they're racing to do it well meanwhile the diversion center which could actually help people since empty it's today in ohio case western reserve university gets some respect in the latest u.s news and world reports Laura, these are somewhat controversial. One of your alma maters plummeted because it had cheated, I think, on the numbers. But where does Case stand among Ohio schools? So Case Western Reserve is first in the state. It's 45th nationally. And Ohio State falls four slots behind them. Uh, My alma mater is third. And the number one national university is Princeton, followed by MIT and Harvard. And 
obviously there are lots of these lists. This is one of the most well-known, the U.S. News and World Report. They look at 17 factors to evaluate 1,500 colleges and universities, but they have been, you know, put under scrutiny because it is just, you know, not a popularity contest, but, you know, you you could argue any, what they're using to rank schools is not really what makes the best school. So they look at graduation rates, retention rates, uh, indebtedness, which is interesting for for student loans, social mobility, that indicates how well schools serve lower income students receiving Pell Grants, faculty resources, financial resources, high school performance, alumni contributions, and then they kind of break it up. So it's not like there's just one list and where everybody falls. They look at regional universities, liberal arts schools, uh, the state schools, and, and there. So you, you could be number one in a lot of different categories. Okay, but your master's alma mater had cooked the numbers, <laughs> right? And it's dropped from like third to 18th. Oh, I really did not see that. Um, but yeah, Columbia would is where I got my master's. And uh, no, I didn't know they're, they're cheating. That's not a good not a good thing. Yeah, they got caught cheating and admitted it and uh they've submitted new things and yeah, it was a big part of the story. But the fact that Columbia did that has raised more questions about the legitimacy of the these ratings once again. Uh and that's why there's been some controversy to it. Although we talk about it every year cuz it's even though it's not perfect, it's not even good. It's pretty much what we have to kind of compare right. and contrast. Well, that's the thing because so many schools are so different and kids, you're overwhelmed when you're picking a college, right? You go and visit, but, and you, you read the guidebooks and you, you, you know, you look at the cafeteria and the gym and the dorms, but um, yeah, this, this kind of breaks down similar schools. Like I said, Kenyon is the number one liberal arts school in Ohio, followed Denison and Oberlin are tied. Uh, then it looks at regional colleges, um, I believe, yeah, John Carroll is first with Baldwin Wallace and Otterbein. So at least if you know what you're looking for, this might help you narrow it down a little bit. Yeah, for my two kids, it was not anywhere near that complicated. They visited Michigan State. They were done. That's where they were going. <laughs> so, and they were happy there, right? And everything they loved all, it. It's yeah. a beautiful campus. And even though, you know, we have many good Ohio schools, we were out-of-state students in Michigan. You're listening to Today in Ohio. The University of Akron doesn't top the U.S. news list, but Akron got some better news, you could argue. What is the big jolt that is getting from the Knight Foundation through a serious investment in the arts? Lisa. Yeah, the University of Akron is the school that could. It's amazing that the, the support that they draw. But the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes excellence in journalism and the success of the communities they serve, they usually invest where they once published newspapers, they gave $31 million to renovate the University of Ak- Akron Polsky building to house community and academic programs for civil engagement and the arts. And this would be both for students and residents of Akron. Um, There's $11 million in multi-year grants for artistic creation and technology integration. So it looks like they're kind of focusing on digital art and technology to to present that and create digital art. $7 million will go to the Akron Art Museum for digital infrastructure and an art gallery for digital works. $1 million in support for the Akron Black Artists Guild and the Akron Cultural Plan. Uh, The National Center of Corey Choreography is getting one and a half million to create a prize, a yearly prize and an endowment. And the Knight New Work uh, Akron is one million dollars for new works with technology by local artists. So they're really focusing on the local art scene and trying to nudge them into the digital realm, it appears. Yeah, and it's a, that's a big ch- chunk of money. I mean, we we talk about if you get three or five million, but this is a, a pretty staggering sum to... Uh, to get. So even though they didn't get great news out of the U.S. News and World Report, they're (laughs) they're rolling in some money and we'll have a building that they can do all sorts of wonderful things with. It's good news for Akron. It's today in Ohio. Anyone with acid reflux worries a bit that the acid is lurking down there, launching esophageal cancer, which is pretty scary. How might some researchers in Cleveland have come up with a way to defeat that kind of cancer, Layla? Well, so a research team from the School of Medicine and Case Comprehensive Cancer Center says it's uncovered a vulnerability of the cells found in esophageal cancers that they believe can be exploited to target and destroy the abnormal tissue. The research team at Case has discovered 
a signaling pathway linked to esophageal cancers and a specific gene that encodes a protein that activates it. And that means that doctors could be able to diagnose and treat patients at much earlier dis- stages of disease. So I actually looked up what is exactly a signaling pathway. And the definition is a signaling pathway describes a series of of chemical reactions in which a group of molecules in a cell work together to control a cell function, such as cell division or cell death. A cell receives signals from its environment when a molecule, like a hormone or growth factor, binds to a specific protein receptor on or in the cell. And after the first molecule in the pathway receives the signal, it activates another molecule. And the process is repeated throughout the entire signaling pathway until the last molecule is activated. And then the cell cell function is carried out. So our abnormal activation of the signaling pathway could lead to disease like cancer. And so drugs are being developed to target specific molecules involved in these pathways. And that's where this team of researchers comes in. Um, you know, the the new drug that they have found inhibits this specific pathway, um, and it's in clinical trials. So this is quite a breakthrough, considering that the survival rate of, of esophageal cancer beyond five years is only 20%. So very exciting news out of this research team. Yeah, and what, are, what it's a reminder of, of is the great minds we have working in healthcare research in Cleveland. We talk all the time about how we're a center of healthcare and we've got all these great institutions, but the reality is there's work being done here that could affect the lives of pretty much everybody on the planet. Uh, If you've ever known anybody that's had that form of cancer, it's awful. I mean, it's, it's just one of the, it's painful, it's unpleasant, it robs people of their voice, they wither away. And like you said, the survival rate is terrible. Yes. Yeah, it's terrible. It really is. Yeah. And, and especially compared to other, other cancers that people, um, you know, I think it's uh, the story that we, we ran said that breast cancer specifically has a much uh, greater outlook. You have, uh, I think, an 80 to 90% chance of surviving past past five years, esophageal is is a much grimmer uh, prognosis. Okay. You're listening to Today in Ohio. One officer after another has been charged with breaking the law on the East Cleveland Police Force, up to and including the chief himself. Who are the latest offers to be accused of using their badges to collect bribes? And what is up with the charges against the police chief, Laura? Well, Vaughn Harris and DeMarco Johnson, they were indicted on Friday, multiple counts each of bribery and tampering with records, also an account of uh, insurance fraud. And they're accused of taking cash bribes to provide a man with falsified police reports so he could commit insurance fraud. These are not a whole lot of money, though. They're talking about uh, paying the officers about $200 each on June 13th and June 20th and a final bribe of $500 on July 24th. That's not a ton of money, but I guess this man, according to prosecutors, planned to use the reports to file a $10,000 claim. So this case has been investigated by the the FBI. The chief, Scott Gardner, was indicted last month on theft and tax-related charges, but there was supposed to be an arraignment hearing. The new date was September 21st that got pushed back. Prosecutors say he failed to pay the Ohio Department of Taxation at least $150,000 worth of taxes between 2014 and 2019. Well, we all know that this is a department that's out of control. We had a mm-hmm. series last year about the number of wild chases that they were engaging in that other departments don't do, some of which had resulted in injuries and death, ser- ser- yeah, mean- death and accidents, and, and they're out of control. And now, one after another is a crook. I mean, it's this is corruption of a police department, and it once again raises questions about, is East Cleveland the city that just completely lacks the resources to provide service to residents? Because who wants a police department where officer after officer after officer gets charged? And and from what I hear, it's not over. There's more to right. come. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I believe they're still investigating. And we two other officers are charged last they were last week, I believe, with felony theft in office and misdemeanor counts of dereliction of duty and interfering with civil rights. So we've got a whole slew of people in an apartment with less than 60 officers. And Johnson, who's in this latest round, he was 
featured in that uh, East Cleveland chase uh, series that we did last year. He led the department in pursuits, 31 chases in the first couple, six months or four months, I believe, of the year. Uh, He left the department. He went to Euclid. He is now on administrative leave pending these charges. But you're right. I mean, what was a huge part of the series was that you couldn't really do anything if you were chased in East Cleveland. You couldn't sue the city. No one would take your case because they're broke. So even if you win, you could win millions of dollars, but they can't pay you. So no lawyer really wants to go through that. And they're not they're not responsible for what they're doing to their citizens. Well, and, and you understand why people don't want to stop for them. If the yes. police there try to pull you over, the chances are they're going to beat you up or rob you or commit some other kind of crime. And so people are afraid that, that they're going to be victimized by the by police who are actually criminals. It's a it's a disaster. And the police chief was unapologetic about his chase policy. Mm-hmm. He just refused to accept he could be doing anything wrong. But now it, it, if the evidence is as clear as it seems to be, he's a crook himself. Yeah, basically, he was like, if you don't want to get pulled over, don't do anything wrong. Like, this is how I keep my town safe. But I would argue it's not a very safe place. No, obviously not. It's Today in Ohio. That's it for Tuesday. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Layla. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks to everybody who listens to the podcast. We'll be back on Wednesday.